So hello to everyone and welcome for this last session. So I'm very happy and honored to start with the first presenter. Here we have Cynthia Barile. She's a PhD student at the Marine and Freshwater Research Center in Galway. And today she is going to present her work, which is also has been just published. So the title of her presentation is Temporal acoustic occurrence of sperm whales, Physeter macrocephalus, and longed fin pilot whales, Globice Globicephala melas of Western Ireland. So the floor is yours, Cynthia. You can start. Thank you, Serena. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, before I jump into it, I really want to take some time to thank all the organizing committee of the ECS because it was really a great event. And most of all, because I'm really honored to be here today to present you my work. And of course, thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, so I will jump into it now. And I hope you can hear me fine and that everything is okay. Okay. So. So very often, as I, if I dip my head in the water or when I put on some headphones for some acoustic monitoring, for example, I often think about how Jacques Cousteau used to say that the ocean was a silent world. Well, we all know, I'm pretty sure here, that the oceans are actually filled with sounds. And I'm pretty sure almost all of you have come across the term soundscape. Um, ocean soundscapes, uh, are composed uh, of first the geophony, which refers to the sounds that are produced by the earth or the weather, for example. There is also the biophony, which refers to all the sounds produced by all living creatures in the seas. And finally, there is the entrophony, referring to uh, anthropogenic sounds. So in the past, oceans were indeed probably much more quiet than they are now and soundscapes are rapidly changing due to increased human activities. And since the Industrial Revolution, biological sounds are more and more masked or even replaced by anthropogenic sounds, while geological sounds are even also affected, sorry, affected by climate change. In a very recent review from Duarte and collaborators, which inspired me a lot for this introduction, uh, they have shown that significant impacts of anthropogenic noise were reported on odontocytes in 94% of around 200 studies that they have reviewed and on misty seeds in around 85% of around 100 studies they reviewed. And research over the last few decades has shown that in particular deep diving cetaceans like sperm whales and long fin pilot whales were sensitive to anthropogenic activities emitting sounds such as, for example, military sonar or seismic surveys. And examples of repercussions include uh, changes in acoustic activity or behavioral changes. Now, why am I telling you all this now? In Ireland, where I work, the, so Ireland has a very large exclusive economic zone which encompasses uh, offshore waters, as you can see there on the little map that I put. And in this uh, exclusive economic zone and in these offshore waters, considerable reserves of oil and gas are thought to exist. But together with this, the area is also characterized by a very complex topography, which is associated with current upwelling events and increased localized productivity. And the area altogether is then considered as one of the most biologically productive regions in the Northeast Atlantic. So these conditions together leads to biological hotspots and many cetacean species, including deep divers, are found such as sperm and pilot whales, uh, on which I will be now focusing on. And since those animals can be found within the Irish exclusive economic zone, all national and international legislative instruments apply, and hence all the species are protected in the area. So in this area, which is of interest for oil and gas industries, but also for other industries, the collecting knowledge and information on the movements and the habitat use of those species is particularly important. 
And this is important because we want to, of course, uh, minimize the potential overlap between the activities and the animals. So in this study, we wanted to explore the acoustic occurrence of those species along the, the edge of the continental shelf. And first, we wanted to do this on a geographical scale to investigate whether we could identify spatial differences uh, throughout the area. Following this first objective, it was really important for us to see whether we could actually pinpoint and identify specific hotspots for both species in the area. And then we also wanted to see whether the acoustic occurrence of both species uh, significantly fluctuated throughout time in the area. With those findings, we were hoping to be able to provide valuable management recommendations, which would help fulfilling the crucial goal of actually minimizing that overlap between activities and animals. So to address this uh, knowledge gap that we used to have here in Ireland uh, regarding those species in the area, uh, two very big data collection programs were carried out a few years ago and both were uh, motivated by interest uh, from the oil and gas industries. The first project uh, was the OBSERVE project, uh, which was a government funded initiative. And the second one was funded by Woodside and oil and gas industry. So as part of my PhD altogether, and so for this study in particular, I have compiled those two data sets uh, and I have accessed uh, data, acoustic data, which was collected along 13 recording stations along the shelf edge that you can now find here on the map that I've put there. And so those sites were selected because they are of interest for the oil and gas industry. All the data was collected throughout uh, several recording periods, so it was not all continuous from 2014 to 2016, but the the beginning of the first recording period started in May 2014, and the last recording period ended in November 2016. Now, before I go further here, I really want to highlight the fact that we actually do not have any data in the winter months. So thanks to those uh, very important data collection programs, uh, we have been able, well, they have been able to deploy bottom mounted recorders following the scheme that you find here. And uh, in average, across both programs, the deployment depth was around 1500 meters deep. And so in 2014, under the Woodside project, they used wildlife acoustic SM2 electronics. And in 2015 and 2016, under the Observe projects, they used AMARS from JASCO Applied Science. And in this study, so if we, since we wanted to look at the acoustic occurrence of sperm and pilot wells, we were interested in uh, vocalizations from those species. So namely for sperm wells, we wanted to look to, to extract the clicks. And for, for pilot wells, we uh, were focused on the whistles. And I emphasize that yes, we did use only the whistles simply because the clicks uh, are very difficult to distinguish, to distinguish sorry, from other dolphin uh, clicks in the area. So all the files, so when I say file, I refer to basically every single acoustic uh, recording that is recorded as part of every single duty cycle. Um, so the, all those files were scanned by JASCO uh, using their own custom automatic detection algorithms uh, which allow them to extract all these vocalizations. So basically from this, if the detector picked up a whistle from a pilot well, then we consider the animal to be present. Similarly, if a click from a sperm well was detected, then we considered sperm wells as present. In the case of absent or silent simply animals, uh, so it means that basically no vocalization would have been picked up, we have considered the animals as absent. So we started basically with presence absence information uh, for each file, for each species. Now, because I told you that we wanted to look at temporal fluctuations, we wanted to do that uh, accurately. So we, we have selected three different scales 
the daily, the lunar, and the seasonal scale. So to look at fluctuations throughout the day, we have included a categorical dial parameter. To look at the effect of lunar cycles, we have included a continuous lunar day parameter. And finally, to look at seasonal fluctuations, we have included a continuous day of the year parameter. So with including those three variables, we have run uh, specific site specific models. So basically we had 13 stations. So we run 13 models, which were identical, just uh, one for each station. But because I also told you that we wanted to look at spatial differences, we needed kind of some way to compare from one location to the other. So we have done that by pooling also the data uh, within each year. And we have run three separate uh, new models. So one for the data in 2014, one for the data in 2015, and one for the data in 2016. And then in those three models, we have used the same variables, but we have also added a variable that, that accounted for the location, so the station ID, basically. We ran all our models in the exact same way, and we used a generalized estimating equation within the GAM framework. So, Thanks to those two data collection programs, uh, we have been able to basically access two, more than 2,000 cumulative days of recordings. And sperm whale clicks were detected 79% uh, of those days, and pilot whale whistles were detected 53% of the days. And both species were detected at all recording stations, so throughout the area, and during all recording periods. So now this alone already uh, provided compelling evidence to confirm the importance of the area for both species, which is something that uh, was reported under the observe report after the collection, but it was also in line with previous uh, visual or acoustic surveys in the area. And it's also in line with uh, widely documented preferences for both species worldwide for oceanic deep waters and slope areas. But the interesting thing is that the acoustic occurrence of the species were not uniform across the area. So before I jump into details here, I want to tell you that, so we did not compare those stations here uh, in white, which were uh, collected and their observe in 2015 and 2016, with those from those sites here in black and their wood sites, which were collected in 2014. The reason why we didn't want to, uh, to compare was because the duty cycles were very different, so we thought it would not be reliable to compare. So looking at first those white sites here uh, and their observe, we have found that the northern sites were very important and had higher detection rates for both species. In particular, for sperm whales, those five sites here were had much higher uh, detection rates than the others. And for pilot whales, we have highlighted those four here. Then if we look at the, the deployment sites here in black, we have found for both species that this site here, more to the west, had again higher detection rates in comparison with those three here. And finally, we have also observed a tendency for detection rates for both species to decrease from north to south, which is something that was also reported under the observe report. So then in terms of specific hotspots, we have been able actually to identify the column and Magdara basins for sperm whales as a very important habitat. And for pilot wells, only the column basin seemed to be more important uh, based on the detection rates that we had. So all those findings are again in line with previous surveys in the area. And for example, a recent study that was published by Gordon and collaborators, which used uh, the toad array data from Observe has found a higher density and relative abundance estimates for sperm wells in this area here in the Rocco Trout. Uh, in, and also in, on the northern slopes in comparison with southern slopes and areas close to the porcupine sea bite. Then for pilot wells, it's also in line with previous uh, studies. And actually, 
So some studies uh, suggested the importance of, of northern slopes as well. And this northerly distribution of pilot wells in Irish waters is not surprising because they are known to belong to a wider Northeast Atlantic population. So now I'll turn towards the temporal uh, fluctuations. Uh, so I will start on the dial scale and I'll be build it up as we go along. So first on the dial scale for sperm wells, uh, only one model retains this parameter. So we assume it was not very important here in the models. And a slight nocturnal trend was revealed there, <clears throat> sorry, there in that model. Um, so now, because sperm wall echolocation clicks have primarily a foraging function, this would mean that um, the, the foraging activity was more intense at night. And actually findings regarding links um, between the dials, uh, dial parameter and foraging patterns of sperm wells uh, are very inconsistent. There is no um, consensus here. Regarding pilot wells, the parameter was uh, more important. It was retained in one third of the models and revealed a slight diurnal trend. Uh, for pilot wells, the dial uh, cycles have actually been associated in previous studies with their diving behavior. Uh, so now if we move on to the lunar uh, parameter for sperm wells, it was not very important. And within the models that were significant, we observed very inconsistent patterns. And this is similar to a recent study in the North Pacific, which also showed inconsistencies uh, throughout the lunar cycles. If we turn towards pilot wells on this scale, actually, interestingly, it was quite important because it was retained in nearly half of the models. But again, the patterns were very unclear and inconsistent from one station to another. And there is very there is no information about the, the influence of lunar cycles on the diving behavior or on the acoustic activity of long fin pilot wells. But uh, fairly recent studies on short fin pilot wells have found a link between the diving behavior and the lunar cycles. Now, finally, on the seasonal scale, for both species, it was found significant in most of the models. But for sperm whales, once again, the patterns were very unclear and unsynchronized from one station to another. So all of these inconsistencies that we found for sperm whales are actually um, supported by a wide dietary range. And that's why we think that those animals are particularly widespread in the area. So you see in Irish waters, so in, in these projects, all the sperm whales that we have picked up are very most likely all males because Irish waters are feeding grounds in which females and young have very rarely been reported. So it's actually not unrealistic and unreason or unreasonable here to hypothesize that the movements of sperm whales is linked directly with the movement of the prey. Uh, now, if we turn to, to pilot wells, as I said, uh, the parameter was also very important. And here, actually, the patterns were very clear and even synchronized across locations. What we have found is that basically the detection rates, rates sorry, were increasing throughout spring and decreasing in summer or fall, depending on the locations. And this, is, uh, this was found uh, in previous uh, research in the North Atlantic which showed that pilot wells seem to move towards offshore and deeper waters in winter, whereas they would move onto slopes in, in, in summer, more or less. So I've thrown quite a lot of results at you right now. So I really want to take some time now to put everything uh, together and give you some take home messages in relation to our initial objectives. So I told you that we wanted to investigate spatial differences. And we have shown the, the importance of uh, shelf edge waters and in particularly of the Northern sites. We have then uh, successfully identified hotspots in the waters of the Column and Magdara basins. And then regarding temporal differences, except for pilot wells for which on the seasonal scale, it was pretty clear and consistent. Everything else was very inconsistent, especially for sperm wells in time and in space. 
So in terms of management recommendations, we want to highlight the importance of a year round monitoring. But most of all, given all those inconsistencies, we want to emphasize the importance of thorough impact assessment prior to any anthropogenic activity in the area. Very few surveys had been carried out in those waters prior to those big data collection programs, because basically we have very, very bad uh, weather conditions most of the time, and it's not very easy to access such offshore waters. So we want to show what we showed here also is the, the very big potential of static recorders to monitor such areas. And so despite limitations that we are aware of, we are confident that our results actually provide robust information on the distribution of sperm whales and pirate whales in the area, both temporally and geographically. And we actually strongly believe that the northwestern slopes, which include the basins that we highlighted as hotspots, as hotspots, sorry, for both species, represent a particularly suitable candidate for an offshore MPA which we will bring forward as part of the currently ongoing MPA designation process in Ireland. And thank you, I want to thank you all for your attention today. And I also want to thank my supervisors uh, and all the partners involved in the project. And if you are interested in reading the paper, please feel free to drop me an email and I'll be happy to send it to you. And yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoy the next two talks, uh, which I'm sure will be amazing. And thanks again for, for inviting me and allowing me to speak today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for your interesting presentation. So we have a few questions for you. So let's start. First is Ashley, who uh, she's asking, what is the reason for lack of data in the winter months? Um, thanks for that. Yeah, it's a very good question. I get it all the time and I actually got it myself, you know, when I started. I think it's one of the first thing I asked as well. Uh, basically, we don't have information in the winter months because, as I said, both uh, data collection programs were funded because of an interest uh, for oil and gas industries. And those like, so when they carry out seismic surveys, they never do it in winter because the, the area, the weather is too bad. So they don't go out in winter. So they didn't want to fund uh, extra so that we could collect data in winter months as well. So that's why unfortunately we don't have anything in those months. Okay, thank you. Then we have Jonathan Gordon, who is asking, first of all, he's saying an interesting talk. And then did you look for tidal patterns in sperm and pilot whales detection? No, we didn't look at that. Because um, we thought that, well, we didn't want to include too many things and we prefer to keep it more uh, you know, parsimonious. And so we looked at the lunar cycle, which was already uh, like not a very common thing, apparently, like for pilot was, for example, like we couldn't find anything else that was done, at least on long fin pilot was. And we thought that tidal, um, tidal cycles would maybe not have such a huge impact because we are so far offshore. But then again, maybe that's something that could be interesting to look at in the future as well, yeah. Okay, then we have Claudia Oliveira. Very interesting talk. Did you distinguish different types of clicks or just use the usual clicks? Thank you uh, for that question. Um, so actually, we are not the ones who ex extracted the detections. It was done by JASCO, who were partners on the project. So I don't really want to be uh, hypothesizing too much here, but uh, I don't think they they discriminated because they basically reported it to us as the clicks. So I suspect that they used usual clicks. And but I don't have much more details on this to give. Also, I don't want to be, you know, going out of my, um, I don't know, expertise here. Let's put it like this. You are doing great. Then we have Webber. So, interesting presentation. presenting. Did you explore the false detection rates of the detector? Yes, so 
uh, basically the way it's done is like uh, so you always verify uh, the performance of the detector so it was done, for example for observe because uh, you know it was such a comprehensive project and so on uh, it was done on that data already uh, when the data after the data was collected so i haven't done it again on that data but i've done it for part of the other ones that were not verified and so yeah basically then we always uh, so we verify a portion of the detections manually we look at uh, basically whether at least one click was detected so for example i would open a file and be like okay is there one or even if there were a hundred i would say one so basically just presence absence and that was put in relation with uh, actually the output of the detector. And then we calculated uh, precision and recall values to get a, a NEF score. And if necessary, then we also adjusted the threshold uh, of detection. So basically that means like, for example, if it improves the performance of the detector, then you can say, okay, uh, actually, if the detector tells me that there are only two detections, I'm gonna consider that it's zero because it's not reliable. So that's what we did. And the thing with that as well that I can, I want to say here now that we are on this is that uh, that's also why we actually use presence absence data because you cannot, except if you would count manually every single vocalization that you are interested in, uh, in each file, then you can't really know whether the detector was successfully identify, identi identifying, sorry, each single vocalization or you know so that's also why we used only presence absence okay then there is um, let me see so um kevin robinson do you also have data for big whales from the study area yes um actually so if you are interested in knowing more there is uh, under observe the there has been a very comprehensive report on all the species occurring in the area so i i don't know if you can still see my screen i think so yeah. uh, i've put it here uh here so here in the bottom you have the link well the link you can maybe it's a bit long but you can uh, copy it or and you can have a look at that so you have information about all the species but then um, there was a paper that was published as well by uh, Katie Kowarski uh, in 2018, I think if I remember correctly. And she used the observed data and she also, she looked at big dwells. And that's uh, my next chapter as well for the PhD. So I'm going to have a look at, the, at environmental variables on big dwells as well. So hopefully that will be interesting as well. Okay, perfect. So there is one last question for you from Lara. Hi, thanks for the pre presentation. Did you have on your data sound of sperm whales and at the same time sound of globi? Because we know that the globi can be predators of sperm whales in different regions when we can have sperm whales baby. Um, you, did you say at the end when we can have sperm whale babies? Yeah um so yeah i mean i didn't verify like all the files obviously otherwise but in a lot of them that i was verifying manually i actually yeah found both uh, at the same time um so that happened pretty often but you know like I, I have the feeling like i don't have data to back this up but i can tell you that like i have the feeling that when i was verifying uh if i had sperm wells uh, well, the pilot was uh, sometimes it was like really, really fainted or like so it sounded pretty far, but then because the detection range for sperm was is higher as well, it could, doesn't really mean that one is farther than the other. But yeah, it happens quite often, so I guess it overlaps. But then, like, the thing I wanted to rebound on with the babies is that in Ireland we don't have sperm whale babies, like, they it's only mature males, so if there is predation from pilot was, I, I don't know if they would be really successful. Like, I don't know, you know, it's big males and they eat a lot in here. So I don't know, but yeah, it's an interesting question anyway. Thank you so much. You have really you. very wonderful comments on your presentation. Thank you for your research and sharing it. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank for you. everyone, now we have like 
10 minutes of break. So you can grab a coffee, have a break, and then we keep on going. So see you at 3.40 in 10 minutes. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.